Welcome to this bite-sized session, Food, Drink and Mood. What's the link? This session is one in a series of short information sessions exploring ways of looking after our mental health and well-being. If you have any questions about this session, you can contact us using the details on the screen now. This video is funded by the Scottish Borders Joint Health Improvement Team Programme, United to Prevent Suicide. The aim of this information session is to provide a brief introduction to food and how this can interact with our mental well-being. At the end of this video, we hope that you will understand why your body needs food and drink and what it's used for. Understand the ways food and drink we consume can affect our mood. Understand how our mood can affect what food and drink we choose to consume and learn some helpful ways to make healthy food and drink choices. Before we begin, please remember this is an information session. This session does not cover information on food intolerances or allergies. For information or support on these, or if you're concerned about your eating or drinking behaviours, please contact your GP. As well as speaking to your GP, you can also contact the NHS Borders Wellbeing Service if you're aged 18 or over, for support to review your diet and eat more healthily. You can find the details on how to do this in the resources section towards the end of this video. If you're affected by any of the content in this video, please remember you can pause it or stop it at any time. And just remember also, mental health and well-being can be a sensitive subject, so do be kind to yourself. If you need help now, please visit this website listed. So why do we need food? Food acts as fuel for our bodies and provides us with energy. We need to refuel regularly because we use energy all the time to breathe, to think, to move. We also need food to provide us with the nutrients our bodies require. For example, we need proteins, fats and carbohydrates. We use the nutrients gained from food to support growth and reproduction as well as to carry out repairs if we are injured or unwell. So what motivates eating? Possibly the most obvious answer to this question is, we eat when we're hungry. Our body sends us signals to tell us it's time to eat. We also eat because it's a habit. When food is readily available, people could eat at any time. But most people have a routine of meal times, with snacks in between. It's easy to think this is what we should have, and we find it unsettling if circumstances prevent us from eating one of those meals. We also eat for social reasons or in social situations. Sometimes we might eat because other people are eating at the same time, and we use the time to chat with them. We may also use food to please others, preparing meals for them and eating with them or we use food as an activity that we can do with others. Eating with others and eating certain foods is an important element in many celebrations and events, such as weddings, birthdays, and religious festivals. Food also has a sensory appeal. The preparation of food can produce tempting smells. Supermarkets often position their bakery so that the smell of baking bread wafts into the store, enticing us to buy it. Cookery books and food packets display tempting dishes and some menus and fast food outlets advertise with pictures. We use herbs and spices to liven up bland tasting foods to make them more attractive to eat. And the sound of, of food sizzling on a grill or barbecue can tempt us to eat too. So the stimulation of our senses of smell, sight, taste and hearing can be another reason why we eat. We also eat because of its psychological appeal. Eating is a pleasurable activity, so another reason for eating is because we like a particular food. We may also eat because we are bored, lonely or depressed, often referred to as emotional eating or comfort eating. The food eaten under those circumstances is often in the form of snacks rather than meals. Snacks can be higher in fat and sugar than a typical meal. 
providing more calories and fewer nutrients. This can cause people to put on excess weight if taken to extremes. What can affect our mood? Skipping meals. Missing a meal, especially breakfast, can lead to low blood sugar. This will likely leave you feeling weak and tired. Cutting out entire food groups. If you reduce the variety of foods in your diet, it can be more difficult to get all the essential nutrients you need. Low levels of zinc, iron, B vitamins, magnesium, vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids are associated with worsening mood and decreased energy. Eating the right fats. Your brain needs fatty acids such as omega-3 and 6 to keep it working well. So rather than avoiding all fats, it's important to eat the right ones. Healthy fats are found in oily fish and poultry. They're also found in nuts, especially walnuts and almonds, seeds such as pumpkin and sunflower, avocados, and oils, for example, olive and rapeseed oils. But do bear in mind that all these foods are high in calories, so only eat them or use them in small amounts. Eating too many refined carbohydrates. High intakes of unhealthy processed carbohydrates, such as white bread and pastries, cause blood sugars to rise and fall rapidly. This can lead to low energy and irritability. There are a number of ways in which our eating behaviour can affect how we feel. Over the next few slides, we will explore each of these in a little more detail. Eating regularly. If your blood sugar drops, you might feel tired, irritable and depressed. Eating regularly and choosing foods that release energy slowly will help you to keep your sugar levels steady. Slow release energy foods include pasta, rice, whole grain bread and cereals, nuts and seeds. And some quick tips that you may wish to consider. Eat breakfast to get the day off to a good start. Instead of eating a large lunch and dinner, try eating smaller portions, spaced out more regularly throughout the day. Avoid foods which make your blood sugar rise and fall rapidly, such as sweets, biscuits, sugary drinks and alcohol. And follow the guidelines in the Eat Well Guide, which advises on the foods we require from different food groups to ensure we have a balanced diet. And here we have an image of the Eat Well Guide. And as I mentioned, it's a, a useful resource to guide us what proportion of food and drinks from the five main food groups we see here that we require to have a healthy, balanced diet. It also offers us suggestions how to eat the healthiest options within these groups. So for example, in the potatoes, bread, rice, pasta, and other starchy carbohydrate group, we are encouraged to choose whole grain or higher fiber options with less added fat, sugar, and salt. If we're thinking about our mood, it's also important to think about staying hydrated. If we don't drink enough fluid, we might find it difficult to concentrate or to think clearly. We might also start to feel constipated, which puts no one in a good mood at all. And if we're thinking about some tips around staying hydrated, it's recommended that we drink six to eight glasses of fluid a day. Water is a cheap and healthy option. Tea, coffee, juices and smoothies all count towards our intake but just be aware that they also may contain caffeine or sugar. Ensure you have your five a day. Vegetables and fruit contain a lot of the minerals, vitamins and fibre we need to keep us physically and mentally healthy. Eating a variety of different coloured fruits and vegetables every day means you'll get a good range of nutrients. For advice in selecting tinned, frozen or dried versions and the recommended portion sizes, please see the Eat Well Guide.
our digestive health can also impact on our mood. Sometimes your digestive health can reflect how you're feeling emotionally. If you're stressed or anxious, this can make your gut slow down or speed up. For healthy digestion, you need to have plenty of fiber, fluid, and to exercise regularly. Healthy gut foods include fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, beans, pulses, live yogurt, and other probiotics. And some quick tips. It might take your gut some time to get used to a new healthy eating pattern. So make changes slowly to give yourself time to adjust. If you're feeling stressed and you think it's affecting your gut, try some relaxation techniques or some breathing exercises. Getting enough protein is also important. Protein contains amino acids, which make up the chemicals your brain needs to regulate your thoughts and feelings. It also helps you to keep feeling fuller for longer. Protein can be found in lean meat, fish, eggs, cheese, legumes, that is peas, beans and lentils, soya products, and nuts and seeds. Again, it can be important to think about our intake of caffeine when thinking about what might affect our mood. As you know, caffeine is a stimulant, which means it will give you a quick burst of energy that then may affect your mood, disturb your sleep, especially if you have it before bed, or give you withdrawal symptoms if you stop suddenly. We find caffeine in tea, coffee, chocolate, cola, and other manufactured energy drinks. The things to think about, if you drink tea or coffee or cola, try switching to decaffeinated versions. You might noticeably feel better quite quickly if you drink less caffeine or avoid it altogether. Finally, in this section, we're going to consider the impact of refined sugar on our mood. Think about a time that you ate too much ice cream or maybe indulged in a second helping of pasta. All carbohydrates convert to sugar in your body, including that pasta. The chances are you felt good for a little while. After a few hours, you may have felt tired, cranky, maybe a little bit mentally foggy, or even a little anxious or unhappy. Oddly though, you wanted the exact food that created those feelings. Initially, sugar satisfies the craving centers in the brain, increases your blood pressure and heart rate, and can give you the feeling of an energy surge. Symptoms of your blood sugar spiking include fatigue and headaches, whereas low blood sugar can create anxiety and irritability. Some quick tips. Try to wait at least 20 minutes after you finish a meal before reaching for some dessert. Often it takes our body a little while to register we've eaten and to tell us that we're full. Try to limit the use of added sugar in hot drinks, such as teas and coffees. If you are someone who likes two sugars, try swapping to one every now and then. And when you're considering eating something sweet, Try to opt for naturally sweet foods like fruit opposed to chocolate or cakes. The need to drink. Although a person can survive for several weeks without food, without fluids, they can survive for only a few days. The food we eat accounts for 20 to 30% of our fluid intake depending on how sloppy the food we eat is. Soups, fruit and vegetables can be more than 80% fluid, compared with 40 to 70% in hot meals. It's said that eating food stimulates drinking. Studies have shown that 75% of fluid intake is while eating, and this also facilitates chewing and swallowing. We can often think we're hungry when in fact our bodies are actually thirsty. Have you ever noticed, if you drink regularly throughout the day, that you're actually less hungry?
do lose throughout the day needs to be replaced by drinking what is available in the food we eat. If we don't consume enough fluids every day, we can become dehydrated. And we might see symptoms such as constipation, dark urine, headache, increased thirst, dry mouth, muscle tiredness, general tiredness and confusion. We can be at risk of becoming dehydrated if we've been physically active and have not replaced our fluids. It's important to be well hydrated before, during, ideally by sipping every 20 minutes and after any activity. Older people are also at increased risk of dehydration, which can often lead to confusion. Tips to stay hydrated. Even being slightly dehydrated can impact on our mood. So if we already experience low mood, it's even more important we stay hydrated. As we mentioned before, it's good to drink six to eight glasses of fluid per day. The healthiest choice of drink is water, but sugar-free diluting juice and herbal teas are also good. Coffee and tea can also contribute to your daily fluid intake, but it's good to bear in mind the caffeine they contain. So try to limit the cups you have per day. It's recommended to only drink a small amount of fruit juice per day due to its sugar content. A 150 ml glass can also count as one of your five a day. It's important to drink fluids regularly throughout the day. If you're very physically active, where the weather is hot, you're more at risk of becoming dehydrated. So you should try to increase your fluid intake on these occasions. You can tell if you're dehydrated by checking the colour of your urine. If it's dark and smells strongly, you're likely to be dehydrated. And although certain age groups such as the elderly or babies and those with chronic health conditions are at greatest risk of dehydration, it's important for all of us to stay hydrated for both our mental and physical well-being. How does alcohol impact on our mood? Well, although we can feel relaxed for a short while after consuming alcohol, alcohol is actually a depressant substance. For example, the relaxed feeling we can experience if we have a drink is due to the chemical changes alcohol has caused in the brain. A drink can make some people feel more confident and less anxious as the alcohol begins to suppress the part of the brain associated with inhibition. As we drink more, the impact on our brain function increases. And regardless of the mood we're in, with increasing alcohol consumption, it's possible that negative emotions will take over, leading to a negative impact on mental health. Alcohol can be linked to aggression, and some people report becoming angry, aggressive, anxious, or depressed when they drink. And although alcohol contains water, it has a diuretic effect, meaning we tend to lose fluid when we drink them, as we need to urinate more frequently. Spirits and wines tend to dehydrate us because there's a higher alcohol content and a lower water content. So try to consume no more than 14 units of alcohol per week. And you can find out how many units are in your drinks by looking at the packaging or accessing a units calculator online. If you're drinking wines or spirits, try and use a measure to keep track of how much you have. Instead of up opting for a double, opt for a single measure. It's also recommended that we spread our units across the week by introducing alcohol-free days. They also help us break the habit of drinking behaviour. And think about choosing lower alcohol percentage drinks. Drinks companies have spent much more time and money in recent years producing lower alcohol content or alcohol-free versions of our favourite drinks. Opting for these instead of their higher percentage counterparts is a really good way of keeping our consumption levels down. And also you could think about adding a non-alcohol mixer to wines and beers to dilute the strength. 
Adding soda water or tonic to wines and beers can reduce strength by, dilu by diluting them. This is a good alternative if low alcohol options are unavailable. And if you find you are drinking more than 14 units regularly per week, it's a good idea to discuss this with your GP. And you should consult with your GP if you're planning to cut back or stop. And then finally, some tips to improve eating and drinking habits. So take small steps. You don't have to make all your changes at once. Pick one or two and introduce these first. Once you're comfortable with these, you might want to take some more change to make some more changes. And remember, the changes you make can be small. For example, going from two spoons of sugar in your tea to just one. Even the little changes can make a difference. Plan ahead. Sometimes we make poor choices because we put ourselves in the position where we need to make a snap decision. Planning ahead can avoid the number of times we need to do this. For example, if you're going shopping for the week, plan out your meals before you go and base your list on this. This will limit the likelihood of you buying things you don't need when you're at the shops. Planning ahead can also come in handy with eating out. Look at menus before you go and choosing what you want can reduce the likelihood of you make, making an unhealthy option when the waiter comes to the table before you've chosen. Involve those around you, letting the people you spend time with know you're making changes and that these are important to you can help them to keep you on the right track, opposed to putting temptation in your way. You never know, some might just choose to make some changes too. Try and keep a food diary. If you notice your mood is up and down and you don't often recognise the triggers or signs, keeping a food and mood diary can help you to to track if particular foods or drinks are making you feel a particular way. You can also choose to track your activity levels too, as, they can, as these can often impact on your mood. Keeping a diary can help us to spot patterns we might otherwise miss. And if you have got intolerances, try to manage these. Sometimes our bodies develop intolerances to particular foods, for, exa for example, gluten or lactose. These can impact on how we feel too. Keeping these under control can limit their impact and reduce anxiety around particular foods. It's important to take care of yourself. We often put a lot of pressure on ourselves to eat a healthy diet, but it's also important to enjoy the food we eat and not to be too hard on ourselves. Remember that other factors can help improve your mental health as well, such as getting physically active, especially in the outdoors to boost vitamin D levels, getting enough sleep, maintaining good relationships, and taking the time to do the things we enjoy. You can have a look at the link listed in the description below and on the next slide for more information on the six ways to be well. Speak to your GP. If you're, if you're worried about your relationship with food or alcohol, and think this might be impacting the way you're feeling, it's a good idea to speak to your GP and discuss any concerns you might have with them. As well as speaking to your GP, you can also contact the NHS Borders Wellbeing Service if you're aged 18 or over, for support to review your diet and eat more healthily. You can find the details on how to do this in the resources section towards the end of this video. And we'd just like to share some resources for you. So there we have the NHS Borders Six Ways to Be Well, the Eat Well Guide website, and the NHS Borders Small Changes, Big Differences. We'd also like to share the NHS Inform, the NHS Borders Wellbeing Service. You can call or email using the details on the screen and below to make an appointment. And the NHS Borders Alcohol Services website. Thank you so much for listening to our small presentation. Hope you find it of use. So this might be the end of the course, but hopefully not your not the end of your time with us. Please look at our website. 
where you can register for more, more of our courses. Or you might like to contact us to request an appointment with a personal tutor. This can help you to find out more about the college and perhaps develop a learning plan. Think about the learning you'd like to consider with the college. If you're not already on our email list, please sign up to receive our, e our newsletter so we can stay in touch and let you know what's coming up. And we'd also really love your feedback on this course. So please feel free to send us an email and let us know what you think. Thank you for watching. This video is funded by the Scottish Borders Joint Health Improvement Team Programme, United to Prevent Suicide.